Okay, welcome back. The African Risk Reward Index is an authoritative guide for policymakers, business leaders, and investors, and reports that uh, after effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and, of course, the Russia-Ukraine war projected to impact the African continent's economic outlook for many years to come, and Africa finds itself in the midst of remarkable uncertainty. To help us understand the dimensions of this uncertainty, we have uh, joining us as part of those who put up that research, Zaina Panimashao, Senior Analyst, Control Risks, joining us now. Hi, Zaina. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me, and it's a pleasure joining you on Business Good morning. to have you, Zainab. So um, help us understand this risk um, that's captured in this index. index. Um, of course, we do know that the, the world was trying to get out of the after effects of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, and then we now have this Russia-Ukraine war which is hitting us on all sides. But help us understand, especially as it, had to do, as it has to do with Nigeria, what are the risks that we're facing? I know recession is one of it. We just discussed it in the other segment. But help us understand more about the risks. Thank you so much. So what we've done under the Risk Reward Index is to track the investment landscape in major African markets, including Nigeria, and provide a longer term outlook of key trends shaping investments in these economies. So based on our findings each year, we then assign a risk and reward score to each country. The three outstanding trends that we've looked into in this year's report, which, as you mentioned, are mainly driven by you know, sustained economic shocks um, from the COVID pandemic and the Ukraine conflict. You know, we're, we're looking at one uncertainty around the energy transition. Uh, we're looking at rising food insecurity and the groundswell of political discontent across African countries. So with the energy transition, we're seeing African countries navigate a global wave of energy diversification and this was mainly triggered by the you know, recent start to the Ukraine conflict earlier in the year. You know, and they're looking for new ways to address local demand you know, for mainly imported energy sources, such as refined petroleum, which I'm sure you know Nigeria imports quite heavily. And at the same time, they're also trying to position for potential roles as key suppliers potentially to Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, with food security, we're also seeing global supply challenges, you know, have been worsened um, based on the continent's broader supply chain uh, deficiencies. You know, so most countries, including Nigeria and other African countries like Ghana and Sierra Leone on the continent, are heavily reliant on the importation of key staples. And COVID and, and now the conflict in Ukraine has exposed this reliance, you know, and it's it sort of triggered exponential hikes in consumer prices over the last few months, especially in low-income nations. And this has then sort of segued into the third risk that we're looking at, which is political discontent. And so because of the rising cost of, of um, food prices, we're then seeing rising cost of living across the continent. And then we're also then seeing this instigate a wave of citizen frustrations. And this has been mainly targeted towards their governments, you know, who have limited resources right now to cushion the impact of the inflation that their countries are facing. Nigeria, I'm sure you're aware, has gone above, you know, 20%. Ghana has gone above 30 Zimbabwe is almost 250% in terms of inflation rates. You know, so because of these revenue constraints that the countries have and existing public debt, most governments are struggling to address these inflation heights and the heights in cost of living. And this has then triggered, you know, discontent, protest on the streets, military interventions, and increased participation in political processes. Now, these trends have now sort of come together to exacerbate global uncertainty um, and the view of growth opportunities on the African continent. Um, and that's what the report in a nutshell looks at, various ways in which African countries are dealing with this and potentially lucrative solutions that businesses can then bring to the table to support African governments with addressing these issues. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned energy transition. Uh, that's like one of the burning phrases uh, going on in Nigeria around the world. And uh, we do know that in countries like uh, the UK, in the European Union, energy prices is a major driver of their inflation at this time. But it seems like back home, how... Um, how prominent is this issue of energy transition? Uh, how important is it when we look at the scale of things, you know, 
with the pandemic after effects with the Ukraine war? Is it what we should be looking at? What do we benefit or lose if we do not prioritize energy transition at this time in Nigeria? Well, I think with, with energy transition, it's really almost a catch-22. So you have a lot of countries, including Nigeria, that have made global climate commitments. With, with, with Nigeria, we made a commitment to get to net zero by 2060. But then con countries like Nigeria then have to balance their climate ambitions with the economic realities of being a hydrocarbon-reliant country. You know, so our economy is, is benchmarked based on the amount of oil that we're able to sell. And the government is now slowly realizing that that's not sustainable and moving towards non-oil resources. But for now, for short to medium term sovereign financing, we still have to rely on oil and the revenue that we get. Now, the strategy that we've seen the Nigerian government, for example, do is rely on, you know, crude oil, we're seeing record crude oil prices, and the government is relying on that to generate, you know, enough financing to support, you know, its budget um, expectations for the year and likely next year, you know, but in addition to that, the government is also looking for opportunities to use existing, you know, resources like gas to then open up, um, explore new markets. So I'm sure you're aware of the Trans-Saharan gas pipeline, which the Nigerian government has recently signed an MOU with the Niger Republic and Algeria, and there's also the Nigeria Morocco gas pipeline. So the idea is that, you know, we currently have, you know, short term financing issues that we have to address with oil. We also have long term opportunities that we really can't leave money on the table for through the gas pipeline, you know, um, situation. So it's really depending on the direction um, in, in terms of what kind of energy financing the country can get to address its energy transition plan. So the projections under the plan, which I'm sure you're aware the government released a few months ago, was that the country would need around $400 billion, you know, to, to essentially transition from energy um, sources like oil and gas. Um, but then at the same time, it then has to balance potential opportunities in markets like Europe and North America, um, and what it can get from selling its gas resources to those countries. So I think that's where we are in terms of, you know, Nigeria and its position on the climate change. Yeah, well, the, the truth is the reality, I mean, you mentioned $400 billion. I know South Africa has been trying this energy transition for a while, and it gets even more difficult because coal is at the center of electricity production. And then back here in Nigeria, yes, you mentioned the pipeline uh, projects, uh, the Morocco, and all those things are investments that require funding. At a time when our revenue cannot even take care of our debt servicing. So, you know, it just seems like far-fetched. Like it's something that we're just saying because the world is talking about it. Because the reality on the ground is the government is borrowing monies for salaries. So how do you now invest in this long-term infrastructure? And I think that's part of what we look at in the risk-reward index. Because what you described is a perfect example of the kind of challenges that businesses can then come into the country and partner with the government to invest in. I don't know that the government's expectation is that it would spend $400 billion itself. The expectation is that it would partner um, with potential investors, with potential development finance institutions um, to support the creation of innovative homegrown solutions to help it transition from energy, you know, like oil and gas, um, to other renewable sources. So in terms of the reward part of our risk reward index, those are the types of opportunities we look at. So we look at things like conventional um, energy sources, not just oil and gas and setting up refineries, but also looking for ways to provide renewable energy sources um, in country. So solar power, um, wind power, biofuels, um, opportunities like that are bound in countries like Nigeria and indeed other African countries where energy poverty is a major issue. You're looking at statistics saying at least two thirds of the continent struggles with energy access. That is a huge market because we're talking about a continent of 1.4 billion people. So if you, are, you have a business that's looking to come into Africa, that is one potential solution that they could look at to partner with governments to, to, to resolve. Mm. Well, partnership will require certainty for investment. And you and I talked about uncertainty at the beginning of this conversation. So that's a discouraging factor 
for Nigeria, the issue of insecurity. We're talking about oil theft and vandalism now. Um, yeah, at, at, at the pipelines. And now we're talking of attracting investments, you know. So we need to be able to assure them that their investments are secure and that they have that security, you know, at the pipeline, even this infrastructure that we want to develop. So, I mean, how do we cross that hurdle to tell them, yes, we are having problems with vandalism and oil theft now, but it's not going to affect your investment even when you do the Nigeria-Morocco pipeline and uh, Maghrib. You know, how do we get cross that hurdle? I uh, 100% agree with you that that is a challenge. Um, I think on the government's part, what is important is for governments to understand how to create, we talk about it a lot, enabling environments for businesses to come in. How do you do that? You're looking at the creation of proper policies that are targeting these businesses and allowing them to come in, proper regulations that are targeting these companies and allowing them to come in, putting together the kind of infrastructure, roads, security, you know, access to utilities that allow them to do that. Um, I do agree with you that part of the challenge is that most African governments, including Nigeria, do not understand how to get that done. I mean, just a few weeks ago, we heard that the National Assembly was asking um, the Ministry of Finance and other revenue generating agencies to review tax waivers and import duty waivers um, just to be able to shore up our revenues. We are aware that the, the Nigerian government currently has revenue constraints. Now, what that signals to investors who are looking to come into the Nigerian market is, you know, you are disincentivizing, you know, those, those, those types of sectors that they would come in, have to bring in expensive equipment, have to bring in, you know, a lot of technology just to support the sector up of factories and industries in this country and they would look elsewhere so they would then go you know country shopping for those countries that have the most favorable investment policies the most favorable reg regulations you know that would help them do that you also touched on security that is a major issue especially with the agricultural food chain and it's part of what's driving food insecurity in areas like you know the middle belt in nigeria where you're seeing you know floods you're seeing conflicts around, you know, cattle herders clashing with farmers. You're seeing bandit attacks on farmers. Um, it's just increasingly becoming difficult for smallholder farmers to go into the farms and, you know, harvest their crops, not to then talk of major commercial scale industrial farmers who would be looking to set up, you know, farms which would hire or employ thousands of Nigerians, you know, and, and produce, you know, enough food to help us deal with our local consumption. So it is a major challenge and I agree with you. And I think, you know, the solution is in the is in governments, the Nigerian government and other African governments understanding, you know, that it's a win-win situation when you create, you know, an enabling environment for investors to come into your country because they're helping you solve problems that you're looking for solutions to. All right. Uh, well, Zainab, I guess you, you captured it there. Uh, there are so many hurdles that the government has to cross or so many things to put in place if we really want to attract those partnerships, which we know we have the potential for, but we have to be Absolutely. able to, to um, uh, you know, allay their fears that their investment will yield what we promised them. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that uh, findings with us. Zainab Animashan, Senior Analyst, Control and Risks. Uh, uh, control Risks. Yes. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good morning. All right, now it's market time. Now we have Anita.